recording. Um, where and when were you born? I think you're a real New Yorker. I was born in Chicago, oh. <laughs> Chicago, Illinois, 1934. And you're an Aries. I certainly am. Do you fit the profile? You think of yourself as an Aries? Yeah, Aries are always people who dramatize their birthday. Aries are enthusiastic <laughs> about everything, and they're enthusiastic about their birthday as well. And that's true for you? I would say so. What What's something fun you've done to celebrate your birthday during your life? Oh, that's, that's hard for me to... Most enthusiastic experience that I have right now is finishing my film. I've been working five years on this documentary film about psychic spying and the CIA. The film is called Third Eye Spies. So I'm really celebrating finishing that right now. We've just delivered it to the distributor, who's The Orchard, and we're going to be released next month. And so I'm, I'm pretty ex excited about that. Yeah, it's like giving birth to a big baby, a big old baby. Yeah. But I'm the producer of this, so it's been a lot of work. Um, and will it be in regular movie theaters, or how will it be uh, distributed? We don't know that. The last thing, it, it's in flux. Everything, everything in Hollywood is always in flux. We believe right now that it will be deliver it'll be shown in several hundred theaters for a limited time and then released to what they call digital platforms, mm. which means uh, streaming and you can uh, streaming and download. Right. Uh, so that that's in flux uh, as of right now. That is I, I don't right now it's scheduled to be in the theaters in February. But there are other possibilities available, so I'm not certain. How many or any of the original um, remote viewers are were able to be in the film? Yeah, Joe McMonagall is a great remote viewer. He's the probably the greatest remote viewer living today and one of the best we've ever seen. And he's in the film talking about his experiences oh, good. working with the Army and the CIA and his experiences with me when we did our, uh, I, I did the, I did Joe's first remote viewing with him. So it would be a stretch, it would be incorrect to say that I taught him how to do remote viewing, but I gave him permission to sit down, expand his awareness and describe where uh, his colonel was hiding. Have, have you found any characteristics or patterns among these talented people like Iggyo Swain, however you pronounce his name. and Ingo Swan? Yeah. And all of those guys it, and the, the women involved, have you found any patterns in their personalities? I would say they're energetic and intelligent and confident. And in general, they have some other skill other than being psychic. Uh, not, none of these people were professional psychics. They all had, uh, Hella, was, Hella Hammond was a photographer, much sought after, distinguished photographer. Ingo was a wonderful painter. Joe McMonagall was a warrant officer. Pat Price was a policeman. No, nobody was on the corner of Haight-Ashbury with a psychic sign around her neck. <laughs> And maybe that's good because then you don't have as much ego involved. It's not like, oh, I've got to do this right because I am a psychic remote viewer. That's exactly right. Yeah, these, that people, these people were all quite confident and successful in what they were doing, and they were intelligent. Remote viewing is an intellectual activity, so you actually have to have your brain engaged separate, to separate the imagination and memory from the psychic signal. When you close your eyes and try and describe something, the image that comes into your mind does not have a tag on it that says this is brought to you by ESP. Now that would be very nice, but it doesn't happen. You have to learn to separate the diaphanous image from memory, imagination, other distracting things in the room 
so forth. And that's a skill. And associations. When we first went to work for the CIA, they wanted us to give our viewers LSD. <laughs> I thought that that would make them more psychic. <laughs> and I said, that will certainly give them more pictures, but they won't. First of all, they're not going to be interested in doing our silly tasks if they're high on acid. And also, it interferes with their single-pointed focus of attention, which is what they need in order to do this. And you were able to do it as well. You substituted sometimes when someone who was scheduled didn't show up or something like that. Yes. I, 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 in, in one time, Pat Price did not show up, and Hal was traveling through South America, and I sat in for Pat Price and gave quite a de good description. And I don't say that to push my own psychic prowess. The, the nice thing about my excellent drawing is that it shows that remote viewing is so easy that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> you don't need any special metaphysical preparation. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back to remote viewing, but let's, let's talk more about your childhood. And... Um, do you know your Myers-Briggs or Enneagram personality types or five Chinese five element or any of those? Now, if I were on the Enneagram, different people have different impressions of my Enneagram. Uh, basically, I'm a three on the Enneagram. I'm a good engineer. I'm able to focus on what I'm doing and get it done. So when I, I was 30 years an engineer building lasers and doing things like that, and people that I hired, I wanted to have that ability to really focus on what they're doing and make sure that that's done. And that would be a three on the Enneagram. What the uh, Buddhists call single pointed focus of attention. Can you do that? And that, that's desirable if you're building hardware that's going to fly in an airplane. Hmm. And, and that was my principal activity. So in my life, I spent 10 years doing, uh, doing psychic stuff, and the other 30 years were building lasers and doing laser research. Right. What, what kind of family did you grow up with? I know your father was interested in spirituality, so, uh, and you did magic when you were an adolescent. What, what, tell us a little bit about your, your family background. Well, I was an enthusiastic young magician. <coughs> Indeed, I used to do magic on stage as a teenager. Uh, my father was a distinguished publisher in New York. He published The Godfather, and a number of he brought Von Donegan to America. He published the biography of Helena Blavatsky, mm -hmm. the founder of Theosophy. Theosophy. So the idea of science fiction and uh, metaphysics was was certainly encouraged or permitted in the household. And he, my father was a really distinguished intellectual in New York dur during my whole lifetime. And was your family religious background was Jewish? Yeah, my mother and father were Jewish. We were non-observant Jews. In fact, uh, when I was 13 years old, I thought it would be good to be bar mitzvahed. And my father said, no child of mine would ever be part of such a practice. Most of the suffering in the world is caused by organized religion. I don't want to go through a bar mitzvah. This was right after, see, I was 13, um, well, I was born in 34, 40. So I was, I was 13 right after the end of World War II. And we were familiar with the German atrocities and lots of other religious atrocities. And my father was, in, was strongly felt that he didn't want to be part of organized religion. Hmm. Um, but you're, you're, you were drawn to really eclectic religious background. The, the Course in Miracles, which is supposed to be a new channeling from Jesus and Buddhism and Gangaji from the Hindu tradition. How did, how did that all synthesize in your brain <laughs> or spirit? Well, I knew that there, were, that there was a reward or a opportunity for spiritual experiences. I somehow 
uh, the interesting thing. Where where did I get that? I, well, I got the got the idea in in graduate school. I, I was twenty when I entered graduate school at Columbia, and what one of the women who worked with me was a member of the Theosophical Society in New York, and I went with her as a 20-year-old young theosophist, and I found that very attractive. I read the, the, the teachings and became interested in uh, Kundalini meditation, which I did for quite a while. Actually, I don't recommend that anyone do that without a teacher, because you can get into mental and physical problems with that. Yes. But I uh, Kundalini seemed very interesting to me, and I read and the reading of uh, the Theosophical teachings sort of prepared me for reading Buddhism, which is a more uh, straightforward, less doctrinaire than Theosophy. Buddhism is not a religion. R Buddhism gives you tools for dealing with the suffering around you, uh, how to quiet your mind, uh, how to parse the suffering and dis be able to distinguish things that are painful and things that are suffering and, g and gives you tools to deal with your day-to-day -day activities. It's so like when people try and meditate and they can't get their mind quiet is because they have no experience finding the off switch. Buddhism gives you, de it gives you tools to do that. So what's an example of an off switch that worked for you in your meditation practice? That's hard for me to say now that I've been, I've been, med I've been meditating now for 40 years. So, uh, it's like with remote viewing, if somebody calls me and asks me to find something for them that they've lost, I can just swing my chair around, close my eyes, and tell them where it is. Mm. So I, I don't really have a, a, a practice like that that I can, can, can tell you how to do that. that I certainly... I subscribe to the ideas of Spinoza. Spinoza and Einstein felt that God is the organizing principle of the universe. Neither Spinoza nor Einstein b believed in a creator, but they felt that there are organizing principles in the universe. So when I'm quieting my mind or when I'm going to bed at night, I'm happy to thank God or thank the universe for my good fortune that I was brought up in a highly educated household. I was given a pretty good brain on the good side. I was given extremely bad vision on the downside. But by and large, uh, I've gotten to be 85 years old. I'm in pretty good health right now. And I don't get credit for that. I'm aware that I don't get a credit for that. So uh, I am happy to give thanks for the circumstances, for the organization of the universe that allowed me to be sitting here at my old age talking to you about the things that excite me. Right. Um, but if you were going to give advice to someone who said, well, when I'm 85, I want to be as bright and alert and creative and interested as Russell Tark, what, what would you say looking back on, ah, that really worked? Uh, I should have done less of that and more of that or any kind of... Unfortunately, the answer is choose good parents. <laughs> Does that mean good genes or that means good parenting? That, mean, that means good genes. <laughs> that is, uh, there's, there's, in my antecedents, I had rabbis and lawyers and all sorts of uh, people who are more accomplished than I am. And I think that uh, I was... I was given some good genes and some very bad genes. But do you that, think that, that I have very bad vision and I have a um, 
a non-coagulation problem, so I almost died several times in the course of my life. But by, but in spite of that, I drove my motorcycle for 35 years and didn't get killed. <laughs> um, so you, I, so you, I've been I've been fortunate. You also had colon cancer and maybe even liver cancer, so um, you you overcame that as well. So it seems, yes. <laughs> Well, you're you're alive to tell the tale that that you've overcome it. Do you? Some people suggest that um, cancer and other diseases like that are in some ways metaphors, and they're a signal from the body. Let's correct course here. Do you do you feel like that, or do you feel it's purely a physiological function? Well, in a certain sense, uh, we all are exposed to cancer every time cells go wild and don't do what they're supposed to do uh, you have some mini cancer which in general your immune system takes care of so your immune system throughout your life deals with cancer so the kind so you're always exposed to uh, formaldehyde and gasoline and airplane glue and other things that are very bad for you, carcinogenic items. Uh, and some people will get cancer from them and some people won't. And whether or not you do that pertains to your immune system. And I think that in your life, if you're suffering or if you're starving or have other privations, that interferes with your immune system. Yeah. So it's not exactly... Uh, a spiritual that I, I I don't have any evidence. I don't know of anything, anyone who says that meditation will keep you free of cancer. I, I don't. I never heard of such a thing. People I know that there is a that people tend to say that cancer is a metaphor for spiritual activity. But I'm basically a scientist. I don't know of any evidence that would make me believe that at all. Um, I, th I think that if you keep your immune system strong, assuming you can figure out how to do that, then I think that uh, you are less prone to getting cancer. That's logical. Certainly, so, if, if you cut down on your beef steak, and eat, if you eat more fish than roast beef, that's probably good for your health. Yeah, absolutely. If it doesn't have mercury in the fish. That's right. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I just interviewed Barbara Stone, who had breast cancer, and she said in her therapeutic practice, she finds breast cancer uh, often has to do with nurturing everyone else but not yourself. And she went through a difficult divorce, and it took 10 years for the cancer to surface. So did you have anything that was upsetting to your, your immune system before your colon cancer? Uh, I would be hard pressed to to identify that. As I was uh, done with graduate school, um, I had just. It was the end of my ESP program at Stanford Research Institute, so I was in transition. There's uh, I left the remote viewing program at Stanford. I was there for a decade. I started the program with my laser colleague, Hal Putoff. Both Hal and I were both known to NASA and known to the CIA. So we could go to these wealthy organizations and tell them, we've done stuff for you in the past that worked. We want some money now to investigate psychic ability. And if they didn't know us, from our previous success, they would never have given us any money. So we had a very well-funded program for a decade. At the end of a decade, it became more and more classified that I didn't grow up to be a psychic spy for the CIA. I was happy to publish papers in Nature and in the Proceedings of the Engineering Society and so forth and write books. Um, but at the end of the decade, by 1982, 
uh, we couldn't publish anything anymore because CIA thought this is too valuable to release any further information. So I left the program. So you could say, uh, when I got cancer in the early 80s, I was in transition, but I was, it was an enthusiastic time. In the 1983, we were forecasting silver commodities, made $120,000 in the silver market. So it was not a, a desperate time. It was a time of change. Right. Um, why didn't you keep on playing with the stock market since you had success with the silver? Uh, because it's a hit and miss proposition. The first time we did that, uh, we uh, planned to do nine trials in November, December of 82. And we were successful at all nine of them and had a lot of publicity about that. Uh, we then had external problems. That is, our investor was so excited about making all this money <laughs> that he wanted us to do viewings twice a week rather than once a week. And because of our protocol, if we did them twice a week, the viewer did not get feedback for trial number one until he had done trial number two. And that lack of feedback, we think, was a problem. Hmm. And we also got a little carried away in the original experiments, the first nine, in a way it was a scientific adventure. Uh, as we began the second nine, it was how much money are we going to make? We began to calculate as we put in more and more money, would we corner the silver market? So we went from a spiritual scientific adventure into a money-making adventure, and that change of outlook uh, might have affected what ha what our result was. Absolutely. But other, but other people have now gone on and used our protocol, the so-called associated remote viewing, uh, my colleague Hal Putoff has done that, and and other people. I uh, have organizations set set up. Uh, have successfully done this now for the subsequent decade. Hmm. My experience was that got me really started enthusiastic about this. Is as a teenager, I was doing magic on the stage and doing so-called billet reading, where, you, where the magician pulls a piece of paper out of a goblet and holds it to his head and says, someone in the audience is looking for their lost cat or something. And is there somebody like that? And the woman will hold up her hand and say, oh, yes, yes, can you tell me where Felix is hiding? And, of course, I don't know the answer to that, but she's very surprised that I knew the question. And the question, of course, is not psychic, but is a trick. But in the course of doing that kind of activity, I occasionally, or even frequently, got a picture of the person's home and their situation so I could supplement my stagecraft, my magic trick, by whatever ESP came my way. Hmm. And since I was already queued up to the idea that there might be magic, mm. I got very interested in that. And subsequently, I've talked to Melvin Christopher, the famous American magician, and the great Kreskin as well. And they agree that although magicians are famous for disparaging mental magic, uh, they, they know that sometimes uh, when a trick fails, they can call on the images that come to them by surprise and supplement their magic trick with whatever ESP comes their way. Hmm. So when you're on stage with the lights in your eyes, you're really all queued up to do an ESP experiment. So that, that encouraged me. And then in high school, my classmate Robert Rosenthal, who became a distinguished psycho psychology professor at Harvard. Uh, as a 14-year-old, Rosenthal was interested in ESP and brought us a deck of ESP cards to my biology class. 
when I was 14 years old. Those are the Rhine cards, R-H-I-N-E? The, the, the Rhine cards, circle, square, star, wavy line the cards. And Rosenthal brought those to us and we had a, our teacher gave us a day of how to do statistics and how to guess cards. And that launched me as a young teenager into reading the literature on ESP research. So when you want to know how did I get involved in psychic research, there was one day in my sophomore biology class mm -hmm. when Robert Rosenthal showed up <laughs> and my fuse was lit. <laughs> That's great. Um, do you think that the near-death experiences that have been recorded, especially since we have better resuscitation techniques, what do they indicate to you about what happens after death? Well, the near-death experience is controversial. People have experiences near death, but I'm not sure that it pertains to dying. That is, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of survival, that I think that people who have truly died and stayed dead uh, that their consciousness is still available. So I think that uh, we do have experiences with deceased people. And not only that, but I think that the deceased people can actually do stuff, can be helpful, can give you information. Whether a person uh, uh, who is in a near resuscitation state actually contacts people who are deceased, uh, I think that there are problems with that uh, from a parapsychological point of view. For example, they get feedback from, the, from those people. Uh, they're in an altered state of consciousness. So oftentimes people get hit on the head or have an accident and in the course of that accident, they can see their body lying on the ground. Right. Now, getting hit on the head, or our near-death experience, is too high a price to pay because we have people in the laboratory who can describe distant things and have uh, out-of-body experiences where they can see themselves lying on the ground. <clears throat> so I think that there are actually epistemological problems in, this, in determining whether a person is actually dead when they have these experiences. That I think the experiences are, avail are available and they're very good, very good data that deceased people can communicate. I know that you, the tragic death of your Elizabeth, your brilliant Elizabeth, she turned off lights to say hello after she her soul passed over. Did she communicate in any other ways with you? Well, several of us were sitting on the deck of our big house in Portola Valley looking over the bay the day after Elizabeth died, talking about her and all the lights in the house, it was a very nice large house, all the lights went out and then they came back on, and, and we were, and her husband was there, and we wondered, is that Elizabeth? And then they went off and came on again, <laughs> as to answer the question, and that has never happened before or since. Right. So it's, it's a kind of uh, evidence of some, of an of intelligence answering a question that certainly gives you pause. And Elizabeth has given messages to other people. They've, she's given messages to people of a, very, of a very personal nature involving things that only, where I was the only living person who knew about an event she described. And she yeah. gave the messages in Russian to some people. That's right. She gave a, she had been doing a healing experiment a distant healing experiment. With AIDS patients? That's right. And after she died, she appeared before one, a nurse in that experiment 
and said, uh, I want you to give a message to my husband, except she gave the message in Russian, which Elizabeth was a fluent speaker, and this nurse couldn't make any sense of it. She didn't speak any foreign language at all. And Elizabeth parsed that into little one-syllable groups. This is Ya Lu Blue. And she said, okay, write down Ya, write down Lu, write down Blue. So she gave two sentences, I see you and I love you Aww. in Russian. Aww. So the woman could do that and send that to her husband. And then I eventually got to see that and I do speak a little Russian so I could, uh, she didn't, the nurse didn't write it in Russian but wrote it in uh, phonetics. What, what I think of for my, as code groups and phonet phonetically. So I was able to look at the thing and not know what it meant. But when I found, sounded it out, it was evident uh, what she was saying. And the reason she did that is Elizabeth was a highly intelligent woman, very gifted, and she knew if she just told the nurse, tell my husband I love him, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. So Elizabeth did that in Russian so that it's evidence, evidentiary that it came from Elizabeth who spoke Russian and that it was so unusual to get this nurse to do something in Russian and then send it to us. Uh, there was very strong evidence that, that, that Elizabeth's fine hand set up that experiment. A brilliant, a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant experiment from beyond. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, we, and we've had other, other things like that. Where uh, she's communicated where, a message for people to write down? Now, where what really impressed me is that Elizabeth gave somebody a message saying, make sure that you give my father this message because that will convince him that I really survived because nobody knows this but him. And she gave that whole message to somebody and that was delivered to me and I was shocked. And in fact, that convinced me that she survived because it was an embarrassing event in early child rearing mm -hmm. uh, that only I and my wife and Elizabeth knew about. My wife is deceased. So nobody else knew about this crazy thing that we did. <laughs> you don't want to say what it was, do you? <laughs> well, Elizabeth was two years old and my mother was in New York. My mother is very fashionable woman and she sent a dress to my daughter, two years old. And the idea was we could meet her at the airport when grandma came to California. The only problem is that Elizabeth never wore a dress and neither did my wife. Everybody wore overalls or slacks. So Elizabeth did not want to wear a dress and she fought vigorously to not be put into this dress. So we sort of stuffed her into the dress <laughs> like you stuff laundry into a laundry bag. And she was screaming her head off. Oh. And she told us at a later time that this was really traumatic for her. Oh. And we were young parents, didn't know any better. But the purpose of that whole trauma was so that she could tell me about it 50 years later at a time where absolutely nobody else knew about it. Oh, that's great. Very, very, very strong evidence uh, that it was her surviving spirit. She had been dead 10 years at the, that point, but she still wanted to get a message to me since I was at that point, which is now 10, 15, 20 years ago, I was much more skeptical than I am now. Mm. Interesting. Good for Elizabeth. Um, so what have been the most difficult times in your life and how did you cope? I'm, I'm asking that because I think it's useful to readers to see even really accomplished people have struggles. The well, most difficult time in my life was definitely elementary school because I went to, this is now elementary school in the late 1930s and 1940s, if you can imagine. And I would be sitting in the front row 
because I couldn't see very well, but I still couldn't see the blackboard. So I went through many years of school where all the lessons were taught on the chalkboard and I couldn't see any of that. Mm. So that was very challenging for me. Oh, yeah. So I still have, so, so whenever we'd have an exam, the teacher would allow me to get up from my chair, parade back and forth and write down the questions, and then I could sit down and try and answer the questions. And that, of course, occupied time. But I did that pretty well, because by the time I graduated from high school, I'd skipped two grades. Hmm. So although uh, not being able to see the blackboard was traumatic, uh, I learned very quickly. So I was 16 when I entered college. So the trauma of elementary school didn't really interfere with my education. Um. It, can you is, can you read books just in the same way anybody else reads a book? Well, that's a no. I have to get much closer, but I can read. I, I have a lot of optical power in my glasses, as you can see. So if I want to read, when I read, I, I'm really quite close to the page, but I can read very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell famously wrote that if you do anything for 10,000 hours and you get very good at it, well, I've spent, since I retired in uh, 1995, I've had 25 years or 30 years, 25 years where my principal activity is reading books. So I've really gotten very good at reading books and I, I can... My, my wife is an artist who has 2020 vision, uh, well, edu highly educated woman, but I read much faster than she does because I've had thousands of hours practice reading. And as a result of that, the eye brain connection has gotten to be very good. And of course, I'm making that all up, but uh, I know for a fact that I probably read twice as fast as my darling wife, Patricia. It doesn't mean that I'm any smarter than she is by any means. It's just that I've gotten really very good at reading for thousands and thousands of hours of practice. Got it. What? So I, in fact, we, we, she, I, I was divorced at the time and we <clears throat> met in church. I was in church late at night, I was at my church, Unity Church, because Paul Allen, the two famous Allens, let's say it's not Paul, Paul Allen, who I also knew was the founder of Microsoft, was Mark Allen, was the president of New World Library, was giving a talk on visionary books, visionary publishing, and I wanted him to publish a book that I had just written. So I was in church to listen to his talk and then to celebrate my book or push my book. Uh, Patricia was there because she was interested in what Mark Allen had to say about visionary writing. And I was making notes in my little notebook and she saw me with my shiny gold pen making notes with my notes nose in the notebook and she just thought that whole scene was very interesting and she just came over with, with a practically empty church and she came over and introduced herself are you a member of this church it's like the like, oh, do you come here often and we became friends in fact, she walked me up to see mark allen and he took a look at us. He thought my book was interesting, and I was with a very pretty girl. It always makes a nicer package. So at that instant in church, I found my wife and sold my book. All right. <laughs> um, Carl Jung says that relationships can bring up a lot of the shadow and the unconscious, and they can be a source of challenge. I, you must have experienced that with, with your divorce. Well, I misspoke. 
that I did not, I did not, I, I had been married to Joan Targ, my first wife, we'd been married 40 years and she passed away actually. So she passed away shortly after we were married for 40 years. And then I met Patricia in church. So I, so I, I, I Joan and I were not divorced. Jo Joan was the sister of the chess player, Bobby Fisher. Right. Was Fisher was the world chess champion and Joan was his sister. So we all went to Iceland in 1972 to watch Bobby become the world chess champion. Hmm. So I, I thought there was a second wife before Patty. No? No. Oh, okay. I got that wrong. I had... I had a partner for a decade. Um, Jane Catcher is my part, writing partner and we, we lived together and traveled around teaching for a decade uh, between the death of Joan and my marriage to Patricia. So I was unmarried for 10 years, but I had a, a girlfriend and partner for that time. So it's like a marriage. Between. Yeah. Yes. Um, what, what about Columbia was you it must have been fairly difficult because you left after two years of grad school physics grad yeah, Columbia school. was very difficult I was not prepared for Columbia um, ma many people interview well my, my my kids interview very well as do I we come across uh, knowing more as knowing more than we really know <laughs> so I went to Queens College in New York which was really not a first tier university, but was was okay, and I did very well at Queens. So I had good grades at Queens, and I had a nice interview at Columbia, and they accepted me as a uh, graduate student and as a research associate, and a research assistant, and that was all very nice. They paid my tuition so I could do research and I could do some of the classes, but some of the theoretical classes were just way over my head. I was not prepared for that. And uh, so the guilty with the explanation, they were taught by T.D. Lee, the Nobel Prize winning Chinese physicist, whose English was really not very good. And I couldn't see what he was writing on the blackboard and we did not have a textbook. He was sort of making up our first year of theoretical physics, and I did not pass that. I couldn't make any sense out of that. I should say the final examination from TDA, the passing grade on that exam was 30 out of 100, so I was not the only one who couldn't make any sense, <laughs> but I made less sense than most of them. <laughs> well, uh, if you can't see the so, board. So, so I did well in most of my classes at Columbia, but there were some things that I couldn't do. Uh, so the, the slightly longer story is I had a bunch of very good friends for, for the end of college and graduate school. And uh, these guys I played cards with, played chess with, went down and ate corned beef sandwiches at the stage. So while other people were going out with girls, I had this little clique of four or five very smart, engaging Jewish guys from the Bronx that I hung out with. And what I did not know is that they were really way smarter than I was. So one of them named uh, Gary Feinberg, uh, he went to Columbia as I did, got his PhD in three years, and two years later became chairman of the physics department. And that was not me. Uh, my other friend Harrison Roth was my bridge partner for many years. And after college, he went to Wall Street and invented the protocol for uh, commodity futures trading. 
In his obituary, it said that Harry Roth invented the whole practice of futures trading. So anyone trading stock at a certain period of time went to a class with Harry Roth. So I had a bunch of friends who were very nice. I just didn't realize how much smarter than I was that, that they were. And they sort of led me to Columbia. My best friend in Queens College was another physics student. Instead of going to Columbia, he went to Syracuse. And four years later, he got his PhD. And I think that if I had gone to, to graduate school with my buddy Lenny Levine, I would have got a PhD as well. But it, it really hasn't slowed down your career. You were able to do laser research and thermodynamics for airplanes. So, it, you know, in the long run, it didn't matter. That's right. I sort of been a pretend PhD my whole life. There's people, I, of course, I never claim to be a, a, a PhD in physics, but people are always surprised when I've published a paper or given a talk. A, you mean you have no advanced degree at all? And when I went to Russia a number of times, they said, well, we want to call you professor. Let's just pretend you're a professor. <laughs> So I was sort of a, I was sort of a pretend uh, physicist, but I published more than a hundred papers in, in in laser research and plasmas and microwaves and stuff that I did for the thirty years that was not ESP. Right, and a lot of scientists say that they get information answers to problematic mysteries they can't figure out they get it in their dreams or when they wake up after they've slept the night Do you, did you find that in your engineering physicist work that that you had access to information that was helpful more than from your left logical brain no I didn't get that but my dream life is pretty interesting in that I frequently like once a month will have a precognitive dream so that I have a dream in the evening that pertains to events that are going to happen to me the next day. And I'm enough conversant with that so that my rule is uh, it doesn't count unless I tell my wife the next morning before it occurs. So what I've learned is that if I have a dream that is not an anxiety dream or a wish fulfillment dream right. or a dream based on the previous day's residue, right. but rather is a bizarre dream, a dream of unusual clarity, then that's probably a precognitive dream. And I have become pretty skillful in separating out uh, the garbage dreams from the precognitive dreams. Can you give us an example of one that's happened maybe recently? Uh, well, a dream that I had uh, last year, easy to describe. Uh, we live in a house with a high uh, pitched roof, cathedral ceiling. And in this dream, I, I had an electric train running around the lower portion of the living room. So, so the top of the wainscoting, this train with a little Mark line electric train, which I don't own. I've never had, never had, I used to have big electric trains when I was a kid, but this was a cute little German electric train running around the track uh, of our living room. And I got up and I told my wife about that because that, that met all the requirements. Very clear, interesting, does not pertain to anything, and is very unusual. That is, uh, I would dare say, nobody's ever had a dream about an electric train running around the living room ceiling. It's uh, sort of one of a kind. So the next thing I do in my morning ritual, I grab a cup of coffee from the kitchen and sit down at my computer where I am now and see what's on the front page of the New York Times. And that day on the front page of the New York Times was the reconstruction of the elevated in downtown Chicago where I grew up. So what they had was an aerial picture 
of the so-called loop where the elevated train runs up Halsted Avenue and then down Michigan Boulevard in a circle past my father's store on Dearborn Avenue where I meant, spent many years of my early life. So they showed a picture of this electric train running in a circle. Elevated. At, past terrain that I was very familiar with and I could hardly, hardly believe it. Was, was exactly what I had described. Electric train running in a circle on an elevated track and there it was on the screen. That's perfect. So what I would say is that my dream at six o'clock in the morning was caused by the experience I had at eight o'clock in the morning. That the, the, the later event was the, I, I believe that events have causes. I'm sort, of un, I'm sort of an unreconstructed physicist. I think if I have a dream about an electric train, then that has some kind of cause. And the picture in the New York Times, I would say, was the cause, even though it resided in the future. Right. Um, I want to tell you, I had a dream about you last night. See what you think of this. Um, I dreamed that you were... I think they call it a Zambozi. It's it's a machine that cleans off the ice hockey, ice skating rinks. You know oh, the the, the uh, z, 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 it begins with Z, like a Zambozi. Yes, Zambozi, something like that. Yeah, I'm you, familiar with that. You were you were driving that machine and uh, so, cleaning so. off the ice field, and then you were in a big um, mowing, a lawn mowing machine where you sit on it and then it, it, it mows the lawn. So I thought, okay, he's cleaning off these surfaces, but I didn't know where to go from there. Do you, does it mean anything to you? Because <laughs> I, I haven't had any experiences with ice Zambozis or that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't, I've seen them. I've been to hockey games and ice skating rinks, certainly. I've never ridden on one. And I've never ridden, I've cut lots of grass in my time, but I've never, see, both of those things uh, are risky for somebody who doesn't see very well. But I, with the message that I got from it, it was cleaning off surfaces. It was polishing, cleaning out, making the surfaces smooth. Well, I did a lot of that as an optical person, so... I spent a lot of time polishing glass. I'm very into polishing glass. The, uh, Hanukkah is coming, so I was busy polishing my Hanukkah menorah uh, a week ago with silver polish. And I bought silver polish, so I should do a nice job polishing my good-looking Hanukkah menorah silver object. So... Uh, I did recently, there was a time a week ago when I was really into polishing stuff. And I, I used polishing st stuff that I had and I bought some special polishing cloths on the internet. So a week ago I was into polishing. Interesting that my unconscious mind picked up on that. It is interesting. Because it has nothing personal to do with me at all. So it's... It's, so it's, that would be a uh, a viewing of something. I, this is a view of the past that you had. Right. You, you saw me at the table there polishing my candlesticks with silver polishing. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, See, that, that's the sort of thing that a three on the Enneagram likes to do. Mm. Let's get things right. Uh, poli polishing glass. Polishing silver would be in the on the enneagram. Um, do you? I'm really interested in synchronicity. Eli, I know Eli Jackson Bear, who's Gungaji's husband. Yeah. He's a uh, enthusiastic teacher of the enneagram, so I I write training with him, and I spent a decade sitting with Gungaji, who was really my principal living teacher. If somebody, when people ask me, who is your teacher, I usually tell them Lanchen Rabja, or Lanchapa, who is a 12th century Buddhist teacher who really 
comprised, put together all the teachings of Padmasambhava, who is on the wall behind me. And Padmasambhava is there with a white scarf. He was the 8th century Buddhist who came to Tibet to teach Buddhism to Tibet. So he was the one, he, he, he wrote a book, sounds like one of mine, or mine sounds like one of his, he wrote a book called Self-Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness. So he invited you to quiet your mind and experience that who you are is timeless awareness. You're not really made of meat and potatoes, but your opportunity is to experience your nature as timeless awareness. And Padmasambhava explained that in detail in his nice book, Self-Liberation Through Seeing with Naked Awareness. And then 400 years later, Lang Champa wrote several books describing them without the uh, iconography of Hinduism, without the gods and goddesses. And Gangaji what has been her main influence on your thinking and your being? Well, she is a follower of Ramana Maharshi, who's a contemporary, died in uh, <clears throat> 1950, and his famous student was F.W. Punja, who taught Gangaji. And the teaching there is to find out who you are, spend some time, quiet your mind, and see who's really there. And the, with the, the teaching of Advaita Vedanta, uh, Ad, Advaita means no separation. No, Advaita is Sanskrit meaning no division. And Gangaji invites you to have the experience in sitting with her the experience of no separation and the expanded awareness. Um, you say in your autobiography that happiness is not craving, not wanting things, not not needing. So does that follow from knowing who you are as a spiritual person? Well, craving for uh, what the Buddha is called cherished outcomes is a sure road to suffering. <laughs> the cherishing stuff and craving stuff is, is definitely leads to suffering. Well, the Buddhists tend to live much simpler lives. Um, but to answer that question, who am I? What did you come up with? Well, what, what I would come with, come up with, is the is the, the language of uh, Long Chen Rabjan. The my my nature is timeless awareness. When you ask me uh, something about closing my eyes and meditating, uh, I'm very experienced now in quieting my mind and moving into that spacious realm, the realm of timeless awareness. And uh, that's very much like an invitation to remote viewing. So if I am asking somebody to describe where their partner's hiding, I'll say, I want you to close your eyes and uh, quiet your mind and look for surprising images that appear in your awareness. D don't tell me where Joe is hiding. Just tell me what you're experiencing. You know, you can't be wrong. All I want to know all I want you to tell me is the surprising images that show in your awareness. And that turns out to be very easy to do. And in my film, in The Third Eye Spies, I, I show uh, how we, we teach a couple of, we show a couple of people how to do that exact thing. And they find downed airplanes, hidden soldiers, kidnapped people, all kinds of different things. We, a, we made a two-hour film to kind of celebrate the first decade of the remote viewing program at Stanford. That's very exciting to have that documented. And the idea, the whole point of the film is that, psych, is that remote viewing and psychic abilities 
are a natural ability. It's not something weird that happens in California, <laughs> but it's a natural ability. And people often want me to, can you teach me to do remote viewing? And I basically, it's like showing somebody how to do an ability they already have rather than teaching. It's not like playing the piano. The, you, you have the ability to do remote viewing, and if I set the stage, then you can do it. Would it be an imposition to tell you about something that I've lost that I would really like to find? Well, I don't know that I can find it for you, but <laughs> I can... We can and, and we won't know if you found it, so I, I think that people will be disappointed. If, if you've lost it and it's going to take hours or days to find, then we won't get closure. I can post it un, under the YouTube thing, no problem. All right. Um, it's, it's a necklace that I got stones from around the world. So there's a ruby in diamond settings and they're, they're in a line like the chakras. So there's a ruby with diamonds around it. There's a lapis from that I got in Egypt there's an emerald so it's it's different stones um, lined up four of them one on top of the other and they they fell off when I had a the chain broke they're on top of each other vertically or in a circle like a necklace vertically so you got these four or five stones hanging from a circular chain. Yes, they the the little there was a loop, a little gold loop that they were all attached to one one upon the other. But is there a, is there a, a circlet that goes around your neck? Well, yeah. The, then the the chain goes through the loop that holds the stones so that you can put it around your neck. Yes. Okay, I got it. And I see the ruby on top. Of the of the of the stones. I see it in the back of a drawer. It's like a uh, a shallow drawer of pretty light wood, like light colored teak. And this is in the back and the corner of the drawer, with it's like a handkerchief drawer. And the, the thing itself is not in a box. No. I see it sort of wrapped up in a decorative purple handkerchief. So I see this sort of filigree handkerchief very clearly with a uh, medium purple border around it, sort of filigreed hanky. And I see this necklace sort of scrunched up in the corner. Okay. So let's see if that works. Oh, great. Thank you. I will definitely give you So feedback. that handkerchief ring a bell for you. Do you have a... I have uh, a handkerchief drawer like that with with different... I don't, I don't really use them, so I'll have to look through them. But I, I definitely have a walnut dresser with different size drawers and one of them has cloth handkerchiefs and things. Yes. All right, I hope we're successful. Okay, thank you. Thanks for looking. Um, I want to look at what critics say after the feds funding the program for over 20 years, oh, there were no results. Uh, the, the, the 
the remote viewers were given too many cues, uh, Geller used sleight of hand. What, what is all that about when they're so clear this drawing matches this Russian missile silo? How can people discount the results? I don't really understand that. They lie. <laughs> we open our film with Jimmy Carter saying, the most amazing thing that happened to me in my presidency is we were looking for a downed Russian bomber in Africa and we couldn't find it because it had crashed in the jungle and the satellite photography couldn't see near the trees, through the trees. But we found a woman in California, you could call her a medium, who gave us the geographical coordinates. We sent a CIA group in to the jungle on a helicopter and we found the plane just where she saw it. So that would be that that's our opening event in the film. And Jimmy Carter is on camera saying that. So it would not be appropriate to say, well that was just our lucky day. No. That's bas that's basically what we did for a living for twenty years. The CIA would come to us and we would find stuff. We found uh, kidnapped people. We gave a medical report on the kidnapped hostages from Iran, where one of them was very sick. And we found, described his sickness and said, but don't worry, we see him, him being pulled out of the darkness and taken out of the country on an airplane. And that, in fact, happened two days later. So, so how, can, how can this be discounted? It's so clear. People are worried about being teased over being psychic. It, that is, it, I tell you in a very forthcoming way that this psychic stuff all happened to me because it happened to me personally. Uh, if I show pictures to somebody and that person doesn't know me, I would say, well, maybe Targ is lying. Maybe it didn't really happen. So the people who are involved, for example, in our film, in Third Eye Spies, we have our two CIA contract monitors, Kit Green, who is a physician who ran the life science division at CIA, and Ken Kress, who is a physicist who is undercover at the CIA. They were the two guys who were in charge of our program. They're senior scientists, and fortunately they're now retired, so they were given permission to be in our film. And you see Ken Kress and Kit Green looking into the camera and said, yes, what Russell's describing really happened. We were there. Uh, they read the transcript in the safe. They found the downed airplane. It really happened. So but what's uh, the investment? There must be some reason that people can be so vehement about denying evidence. Well, the Catholic Church doesn't like it. The, the Church is always worried about freelance spirituality. That is, uh, remote viewing seems like a, um, a metaphysical activity. Uh, it's all right for you to talk to God, but you get in trouble when God talks to you. <laughs> So I think, and, and there are a lot of, uh, everyone knows there are a lot of fake mediums. So why don't people believe this is sort of forbidden since the time of the Enlightenment? Since the Enlightenment, at the time of the Enlightenment uh, is when you got uh, mind-body separation. Rene Descartes said that the body that's made of meat and potatoes and the mind which will survive after death, and they're quite different from one another. So the idea that your mind, which is separate from the body, can travel around and give you information is really contrary to the accepted, uh, accepted ontology. It's, forbid it's, for it's basically, it's forbidden by the Catholic Church, so the tradition of the idea you can't do that. Also, it's not readily explained by uh, physics. 
There's, uh, we get information from the future, and causality says uh, you can see what's happening in the present time, you can figure out what happened in the past, but uh, you can't see into the future. Now physics is changing and becoming much more accepting of that. In fact, I've gone to two conferences sponsored by the American Institute of Physics that deal explicitly with retro causality. That is, the physics that occurs in the present, but it's caused by the future. So retro causality has become a much more accepted and important part of modern physics. What, what's an example that a physicist would give at one of those conferences of retro causality? There, there are a number of things that occur in particle decay where you have something caused by an event that appears to have taken place in the future. Retro causality and particle decay is one of the things that people are interested in. Hmm. Um, do you think that the Russians and the Chinese and the U.S. intelligence agencies are still doing remote viewing and using psychics and they, they just don't want to talk about it and they want to disparage it because they're doing it? And they want it secret? Well, when I was I was in Russia in 1983 and 84, there was great interest in psychic abilities, and people at uh, in the town of Yerevan, at the Armenian Academy of Sciences, they were doing remote viewing that looked very much like ours, uh -huh. the same kind of things. And, and in fact, one of the things that the professor, uh, Ruben Agazumsan, told me is that he sometimes had his remote viewers describe targets where someone was going to be hi hiding and they would describe them before the target was even chosen. Mm. So they had their so-called real-time remote viewing contaminated by precognition. <laughs> hmm. Now, I don't know um, what the Chinese are doing. I know that the Chinese are get, often get involved in careless, fraudulent-seeming experiments. So people keep going to Russia, going to China, and the Chinese have prodigious demonstrations of psychic ability that turn out not to be particularly well done. Mm. Now, in the film, Kit Green says, well, the remote viewing worked so well for two decades, uh, his understanding is that the CIA is still doing this. Why, why would they not? Because right. it was uh, very useful for them, it's inexpensive. And I trained two CIA operatives who came to our lab, and then they went back, and they're still there. So, okay. that, so according to Kit Green says on camera that they're still doing this, the best of his knowledge. As you say, they would be foolish not to because it's so inexpensive and risk-free. Put people and in a room it, and it, it, it's, a, it's also important regarding remote viewing. In, in the intelligence community, you never use a single asset. So if we describe uh, that the Koreans are setting up a nuclear weapon to getting ready to fly for a test and we tell you that by remote viewing uh, nobody would take action on that until you had two or three other on the ground in the air so forth from space to corroborate that we would just be one asset of which there would always be many right so if somebody says well why would you trust the guy in the laboratory who says some crazy thing? The answer is you wouldn't. You would want two or three other sources, as you always have in the intelligence community. You, I can really stress that CIA would never take any action based on what got, based on the sayings of one person. Right. That's what science is about: is replicability. Um. 
in your book you quote Henry Stapp at UC Berkeley who says non-locality may be the most important discovery in science. I'm bringing that up because it can explain why we can do remote viewing and all these other paranormal phenomena. Do you want to elaborate on that? Do you agree with him? Well, I agree with him in that non-locality is a very important idea. Erwin uh, Schrodinger said that uh, consciousness is a singular of which there is no plural. Schrodinger was a outspoken um, Vedantist. He, he, he felt that consciousness is primary. The fact that you have non-locality makes it appear that there's a, well, there, there is a quantum mechanical effect where particles created at the same time uh, remain connected to one another like identical twins. Uh, I don't particularly believe that that's the explanation for psychic ability. I, I think psychic abilities occur not through quantum mechanics, but through the geometry of the space we live in. Um, famous physicist Wheeler, whose first name escapes me, said that the answer is not in the field, it's in the geometry. Explain and I think that. that. That's interesting. And I think that we live in a multidimensional space-time where there is always a path or a trajectory through the space so there's no separation. How many dimensions? Well, we, we live in a normal four-dimensional space-time, three space dimensions, one time dimension. Now, my... Partner Elizabeth Rauscher and I have published widely on the idea that each of those dimensions, each of those four dimensions, has a real part and an imaginary part. And what we normally see on the kitchen table is the real part, but there is also an imaginary part which is compatible with modern physics, doesn't generate any bad physics. But if you have this complex space-time, it's complex and that is real and imaginary, then there will always be a trajectory through that space-time where uh, the sum of the parts making up the distance add to zero. For example, if you have a triangle, the hypotenuse of that triangle is x squared plus y squared. You've heard in high school geometry, Pythagorean theorem. Now in complex space, if one of those is a real side and one is the imaginary side, then you could add the complex, the real x squared to the complex y squared. And if x equals y, that would add to zero. You'd have that x squared minus x squared is the hypotenuse in the eight space, they add to zero. So there's no, no mumbo jumbo, no, there's sometimes people say, well, maybe ESP is in another dimension. We, we are not adding another dimension just for the fun of it to explain ESP. We're saying that our present space time could be described as a complex space time. And Minkowski, who developed space, Minkowski developed the complex space-time that Einstein uses. That is, uh, Einstein measures distances with three spatial dimensions in a complex time dimension, which is the square root of minus one times the speed of light times the time, ICT, and you square that and you get a distance squared. So in relativity, distances are x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus ICT squared, where T is a time, and that squared becomes a negative number. So there's a, and even in relativity, you can have a complex space-time which works. As relativity works all the time. It's been proven now for a hundred years. So we're saying that uh, Minkowski initially proposed that all of those dimensions be complex, 
And Einstein said, I don't need them to be complex. It's enough for time to be complex. But, uh, and I'm telling the story about Minkowski because I want to emphasize that this just isn't some weird thing that we made up to solve the ESP problem, but it's a bona fide geometrical metric uh, that does other things. So complex space-time called complex Minkowski space-time is a thing. It's, just, it's not just an ESP gimmick. Um, is another word for imaginary probability? I'm trying to understand what an imaginary field is. Ima imaginary is a misnomer. That is, uh, the square root of minus one is not something we can realize ordinarily. You can't take the square root of minus one. So it's, it's become called an, it was called an imaginary number and that's the unfortunate thing. It's not imaginary, it's a perfectly good number. There's all of electro, all of electromagnetics involves complex numbers. So it, it just, uh, it, it's a eight dimensional way of writing the space time that we live in that gives you uh, zero total distance as you, it gives you, a, it always gives you a path. See, I, I don't know where you are actually, you're, you're on the screen in front of me, but there would be a path through space time from where I am to where you are so that there's actually no separation between us. Does, does... And, I, and I think that the geometrical description of psychic abilities is simpler, it's more parsimonious than trying to get a quantum mechanical explanation. Now, quantum mechanics is very successful, so I'm not saying that uh, ESP is geometrical and it violates quantum mechanics, so you can't violate quantum mechanics because quantum mechanics is the truth. It really exists, it works. I'm just saying that that's not the easiest way to describe uh, how ESP works. What, <clears throat> the fact that 95% of the universe is dark energy and dark matter, does that relate to this imaginary complexity at no, all? That just shows how ignorant we are. Yeah. That is, a, the universe is full of things we don't understand. Right. Kurt Gödel was a great mathematician of the previous century, wrote the very famous incompleteness theorems that show whenever you have a body of axioms describing something, it will contain some axioms whose truth or falsity you can't prove. So whenever you have some great body, let's say, like all the axioms of modern physics in the universe, there are going to be some things in that that you can't prove within that with, within that framework. So there's, there's fundamental uncertainty. And Gödel's considered one of the greatest mathematicians of all time because he shows that there's limits to what we're able to prove. So the incompleteness theorems are considered a great contribution. And he's not he's not alone. There's Neil Bohr talked about who gave the first coherent description of the atom, developed what he called complementarity. Everybody wants to know, is light a wave or is light a particle? Because sometimes when it goes through a prism and breaks up into a rainbow, it looks exactly like a wave. When it strikes the detector in your light meter, it goes tick, 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 counting off the photons. So you want to know, is light a particle or is it a wave? And the observable is, is a particle or a wave depending on what you use to measure it, which is, of course, very unacceptable, <laughs> but it's the truth. So um, Bohr gave the answer, which has now been accepted for 75 years, that it has a dual nature. L light is both a wave and a particle, and, it's, and 
That's all there is to it. Now, the Buddhists understood this. At the time of Christ, there was a great uh, grammarian philosopher named Nagarjuna who said that most things are neither true nor not true. And he said a lot of suffering that we experience is because of Aristotle. Aristotle, who was 500 years before Nagarjuna, said that the middle is excluded. A thing is either white or it's not white. There's no gray for Nagarjuna. There's no gray for Aristotle. And Aristotle said that makes for a lot of suffering, it makes for things like the mind-body problem. Is this a mind or is it a body or are they separate? And uh, Nagarjuna, if he was asked about that, he would say uh, they're, they're neither one nor separate. It's the wrong question. The mind and body are, is, are one thing, and you get wrong answer if you try and say it's one thing or the other thing. So the mind-body problem has no answer because it's a, it's a false question. Similarly, a high school graduate student says, well, uh, I see this flashes of light. The, the light must be a particle. It's going flash, 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 and it strikes the photometer. And he said, well, on the other hand, it breaks up into spectrum when it goes through a prism. Tell me, teacher, is it a wave or is it a particle? And you don't get... You don't get that answer. Light, light is a dual nature. There's neither a wave nor not a wave, is what Nargajuna would say. Just like the body is neither separate nor united, there's, there's, only, there's only one thing, and it has two manifestations. And I think the psychic functioning is in that realm. That we're not going to get a simple explanation unless we get some uh, significant advanced knowledge. That we may learn more about the eight space um, complex geometry that will allow... See, the eight space complex geometry allows you to see into the future. It, it, you can... There, you're going to have two points in space-time. One is called here and now. This is where we are. And the other one, you look at the uh, San Francisco Warriors basketball game is going to place in Texas tomorrow. So that they distance a, a thousand miles and 24 hours between me and that, and that basketball game. But in this model of space-time, there will be a path through space-time that goes from here and now to tomorrow and Houston, and we can see the outcome of that basketball game because there is a path through space-time that goes from where I am now to my seeing the game on the screen tomorrow and they'll post the score. And that's just like forecasting silver futures. I could close my eyes and meditate and see what the final score of the game tomorrow is because that path is available. And does the path only exist if you observe it and put your intention in it? Does that make the path? No, no, no. I would say it, it's like a all paths are available. All, right. all paths are available. You just live in a multiply connected world. There is the great secret in the ESP world and the remote viewing world is that it's no harder to describe something um, in Soviet Siberia than it is to describe something across the street. Right. In increasing the distance does not at all make it difficult. And not only that, looking into the future is no, difficult, no more difficult than describing something contemporaneous. So we did many trials where you have to our standard experiment is somebody goes to hide in a distant location and no, none of us have any idea where that is. And then I will guide the person I'm with to describe where Joe is hiding. Now, 
that works qu quite well. And many people have done that. Many laboratories have done that. But in addition, I can ask you, here we are at 1230. Tell me where Joe is going to be hiding at 230, even though he has not found his place yet. And that works just as well, or perhaps better. But the, the evidence is that precognitive remote viewing is absolutely as successful as real-time remote viewing. So the path we have through space-time to the hidden person right now or the hidden person two hours in the future, those are absolutely as easy to do as one another. And we've published all that. We've published that in the premier journals in world science, and that work has been replicated. That's that's fascinating. It is, it and it's expansive. It it makes us realize that um, as human beings, our understanding is is you know a tiny percent of understanding what really is. <laughs> the the fact that we can see into the future as well as into the present yeah. really supports the idea that the um, complex space time model is the explanation rather than quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics allows teeny weeny things to show these reversed causality effects microscopically, but remote viewing done by competent people and experienced viewers works most of the time. That is when we sat down to forecast silver, we did that nine times in a row, describing what's gonna happen down at the commodity exchange, uh, 50 miles from where we were, and seven days in the future, and that worked perfectly. We had wonderful descriptions, and we published all that with the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So this is not a teeny-weeny effect. Remote viewing worked very well in our lab for 20 years. So it's, an, so it's not a, it's a mistake to think that remote viewing is weak. Remote viewing is not a weak effect in the hands of people who actually know what they're doing is very reliable. Because we had an army program, I trained up a number of people for the Army Psychic Corps at Fort Meade, and that went on for a decade, doing, doing application for the CIA. And Joe McMonagall was one of the premier viewers there, and that was very, very successful. Hmm. Um, let's just say a word about the books that you've written as a sole author, um, what their themes were. Uh, Limitless Mind, is that's mostly about remote viewing? Remote, yeah, that was my first book all about remote viewing, and it talks about some of the work that my daughter did in distant healing. I wrote that uh, shortly after Elizabeth died, so it talks about her work and about remote viewing. And my last book, was called The Reality of ESP, A Physicist's Proof of Psychic Abilities, which describes really the history of our work with remote viewing. And we have a chapter telling people how to do that in working with a friend, how to develop your own psychic abilities. So uh, for a person starting uh, to understand and use psychic abilities, um, the reality of ESP would be a good place to start. And then, um, do you see what I see? Your autobiography is really interesting reading. I read it out of duty, but I was happy to read it. <laughs> you know, I'm I, I wanted to read that. it. <laughs> it's great. It's very down to earth with food preferences and women you fall in love with, as well as the the science of it all. What What's your next book after this? The documentary comes out. I'm sort of done writing books. That is. Uh, Reality of ESP was an excellent book, in my opinion, and that didn't sell very well because I think people are, I think these days people watch television instead of reading books, and reading books is such a lot of work. I, I believe that this film describes what I really have to say. People are going to be on their own, and, unless I think of some new idea. Um. But I know you're going to be reading and thinking and analyzing what what things. I, I may I may make a fictional film. 
about a remote viewer. Ah. That's sort of on the on the back burner of what's in my mind. What about um, books that you have in mind to read in the f future? I think I'm going back and read uh, the Buddhist teaching. Go back and read uh, Lon Chem Rab John. Hmm. Could call Lon Champa. He wrote these books. His books are really quite a transmission. So I really enjoy reading his books about this. He's a brilliant philosopher and obviously a, a potent remote viewer. Now, he, of course, doesn't talk about that. He talks about timeless awareness, but, but, uh, but I know what he's talking about. And he talks about that as our nature. For example, he says that uh, because of our inherent timeless awareness, our consciousness doesn't pertain to cause and effect. He said cause and effect is not an attribute of mind because mind is out of time. So physicists are always shocked to know that you don't have causality. Because a physicist says, yeah, I don't, if I don't understand causality, I don't understand anything. And that's really a threat. And Longchamp understood that. He said, for consciousness, there is no causality. And what he specifically says is there, there is no cause and effect for consciousness because consciousness is outside of space and time, which is quite a daring thing to say in the 1200s. Hmm. I mean, that sounds like contemporary relativity, but he's talking about space and time as though they he just he just got it by direct transmission. Hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you about the world situation that we have this plethora of election of autocrats around the world.